Welcome back to the Be All Radio Show. This is episode three. I'm Jordan Tom, followed with Brian Rowan, and we got special guest Maurice Worthy on tonight. Uh, before we get into tonight's episode, I just wanted to thank everybody for your support, all the great feedback we've got. Um, if you haven't liked our social media pages, please do so. That does help a lot, especially when you guys share. Uh, word of mouth is the best publicity we can get right now. So share it with your friends, share it with your classmates, and definitely with your teammates. This And just so you know, this episode is sponsored by Glazed Over Donuts in, uh, in Beacon, uh, Tompkin, the Tompkins family. Uh, make sure you also check out our apparel site. Get your B-Hog gear. I'm wearing some of it now. Um, Crest Steel, we're, we've partnered with as well. So uh, make sure your know, Father's Day is coming up. So uh, it'll make a great gift. All right. Tonight's episode, we got Maurice Worthy, who's a 2002 grad in high school, two-time state champ from New Jersey. He was a three-time NCAA qualifier, a three-time place winner and champ of the EIWA conference and a national runner-up. Uh, Maurice, how are you doing tonight? Doing good. How are you guys doing? Great. Super excited to have you. Couldn't be more excited. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited too. You guys are doing, doing good things. This is great exposure for Army. Yeah, I'm pumped up about this. So uh, I told... Mo off air, but uh, he's going to hear the story for the first time. But his poster used to hang above the scale in the locker room when I was there, so back in 2013. And um, the, the people that know me know I used to cut quite a bit of weight back in the day. And so I would come in on a Sunday extremely heavy, and I would want to just cry or, like, rip the door <laughs> off a bathroom stall. And your poster was always there. And I always remember seeing it. It had, like, a little – Thing at the bottom said like NCA runner. I was like, if he can do it, I can do it. And so I've never told you that before, but even you know, ten years after the fact, you know, motivated me to do my best. So I appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, especially so, uh, especially as Mo dives into his some of his cutting weight stories, uh, it'll, it'll actually <laughs> tie it all together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Exactly. Connection, Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Before we even knew it. Yeah. So looking at your beginning years, Mo, so uh, two-time state champ from New Jersey, obviously a super tough state, one of the power states for wrestling. Um, what did your recruiting kind of look like and uh, what kind of led to you making the decision to ultimately go to West Point? Uh, well, West Point, so I had history with, uh, with Coach Effner. So when I was young, um, 10 or so, uh, I went to, to Army camp a couple times. And Efner, he used to joke at the time with me and my brother, like, you guys are future cadets. <laughs> we were like, ah. <laughs> we, but we used to, you know, we were those little uh, little kids that used to do, like, push-up contests when everybody else was resting in between, like, sessions and stuff. And um, we were pretty active, energetic little kids, and, and he loved our energy. So um, ended up, you know, not going there as I got older. And when I got to my sophomore, I think into my sophomore year, um, he reached out and that's how the process started. Um, outside of, outside of West Point, you know, I was, I was looking at a couple of, of uh, other schools, had some other schools interested in me, um, narrowed to my top, I think my top four or five at the time, I was looking at um, UPenn, Boston University, um, Syracuse, Virginia Tech. And I remember, I had a, um, a a dad who was a wrestling coach at a, a neighboring high school, and his son was actually on my high school team. Um, and Arizona State was interested in me, and that was going to be like my last recruiting trip. And I uh, told him I was like, "Yeah, I think I'm going to West Point." He was like, "If you're going to West Point, do not take your retru recruiting trip to Arizona State." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Okay." I mean, I was a good listener, so I said, "All right, I'm canceling it." So I canceled my Arizona State trip in, uh, in West Point is where I ended up. So it was just very comfortable with Efner. So. When, did yeah, you, so when did you commit to, um, to West Point? You know, was it like in the middle of your senior year, before your senior year? Like it was right, right at the beginning of senior year. Um, I remember having a call. If you guys know, like Gene Mills, he was the head coach at Syracuse at the time. And he was somebody that I idolized. And I remember having to call and break to him that, actually wasn't going to like Syracuse where he was and it turned out to be a good thing because they dropped the program <laughs> yeah. a couple years later. Um, so I, I believe it was actually end of September, my senior year. 
So right when school is getting going. Definitely interesting to hear some of the programs you mentioned, Boston University, Syracuse, man, a lot of different options back then. Was yeah. there people kind of in your corner that were telling you maybe not to go to West Point? Uh, pretty much everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd had some cousins that had um, enlisted. Um, my grandfather was enlisted. He served, but but not a ton of uh, of family members that had gone in the military, and and very few that actually knew um, very much if, if anything about West Point. But um, you know, during my uh, recruiting visit. You know, at the time, uh, Brad Finsky was just finishing up, and and uh, he was he was a beast of a wrestler and, a, and an even better person. And I was drawn to him. I was drawn to like Joey Hess, who was a plebe at the time, who kind of showed me around, and just drawn to the the level of excellence that West Point um, strived to achieve, and all the cadets that were there. Um, not to take anything from like Syracuse and Virginia Tech and those places. But it was just a completely different experience. And me, um, coming out of high school, I, I considered myself a high achiever, and I uh, I wanted that challenge. And it's interesting, like when you go on recruiting trips, uh, every coach would say, "Well, where else are you looking, right?" So, what's your top five? And I'd rattle off the other schools, and then I'd always end with West Point. And every single recruiting trip I went on, they said, "West Point, um, you can't win a national title there." That's what they say to me. And that was, that was, that was honestly the worst thing that they could say to me because I was, you know, I was the man coming out of high school, you know, hadn't lost in two years. I was like, Oh, I can win a title at West Point and I'll show you guys by going to West Point and doing it. So, I don't know. There was some truth. I love that. Yes. But, but I accepted that as a challenge. So they actually helped push me over the edge to pick West Point by saying, Oh, you can't win a national title there. So, so even though I ended up runner up, I, I absolutely believe it's possible. So hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so coach Efner was the one that recruited you and you had him for your first year. Right. And then yep. coach, coach Giles then took over from being the assistant coach bumped up to the head coach. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, so you went two coaching changes then, and then your senior year, you got coach Barbie. So three coaching changes in your career at West point. I would yeah. definitely want to talk about that. Um, from the perspective of what kind of changes you saw and um, then going to ask you some more questions about coach Barbie, but what, what kind of changed throughout the four years as you got three different coaches? Well, it was, I mean, we were, we were basically uh, the class of transition is what I'll call um, our class because we came in under, under Efner who'd been there for a long time since like you know mid 80s and so the program was very very set in how Efner wanted to run things we also um you know we had our room established in Arvin um coach Giles he was uh he was a very very good assistant still very active with rolling on the guys rolling with the guys and uh and pushing us he was a marine so we had that bravado that comes with being a marine um and we transitioned from a really, really stable environment to Efner at the end of our freshman year, um, deciding to leave and go to Cleveland State. And uh, Giles getting the opportunity to take over. And I had prior history with Giles too, because I'd gone to Boston University camp, uh, his alum, um, in high school. And, and he was at that camp, so I knew him. Um, but when he got into the head coaching position, uh, we completely lost the stability that we had prior. Like him and Efner working together were an amazing team. Um, but once Efner left and Giles took over and we got new assistants, we just didn't have that same, that same sense of security and structure. So it was a pretty, uh, a pretty rough two years throw on top of that, that we got kicked out of Arvin because they were doing the, uh, the remodeling. So we lost our wrestling room. We had to move into Cullum hall, um, without showers. So we'd have to, uh, cross the street and, and we showered in the baseball locker room, um, every single day. Um, that was just, 
you know, part of doing business as an army wrestler at the time. And so it was just, we were basically homeless. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and after Giles is uh, two years, um, he decided to walk away, decided, you know, that I guess things weren't working out or he wanted to pursue other interests. And that summer I'd been out to um, University of Oklahoma and uh, my brother, he, he was a three-time state champ in Jersey too. So my brother was a freshman at OU at the time. Um, and when I was out there, I was talking to Coach Spates, who was the head coach at the time. And I was like, can you review my tape? Like, I'm, I'm really trying to do big things my senior year. And he was like, eh, you can work with this guy, uh, uh, Chuck Barbie. He'll review your tape with you. Like, All right, I don't want Barbie. I want you. You're the head coach. I don't know who Barbie is. And my brother's like, no, you want Barbie. Barbie runs the show. Like Barbie's, Barbie's the man. Barbie's it. Barbie's the reason OU competes with OSU right now. It's, it's all Barbie. And uh, I was like, all right, I'll give him a chance. And uh, that was my first introduction to Barbie. And it's, it's crazy because we came back, Giles left, and Matt Ross and I, uh, because we didn't have a head coach, you know, Matt Ross and I were captains and we were running all the, um, all the off season training and working out and stuff. And we're going through the recruitment process and the Colonel <clears throat> uh, pulls us in Colonel Polka. And he's like, we've got two main candidates that we're really considering. Um, this is after going through the whole process that we're really considering for the position. And uh, we're really, really excited, really excited about one of them. His dad's a former Marine. Um, you know, he's got that, that, just that bloodline, that DNA of like military. And he was a beast of a, of a competitor and a wrestler. And his name's TJ Jaworski. And, uh, and if you know TJ Jaworski, he was everything that the Colonel said he was. He's, he's a mean guy. I think he won two or three NCAA titles uh, from North Carolina. And, and the other guy that we're really considering, really, really, uh, really potentially excited about is this guy, Chuck Barbie from OU, uh, <laughs> leaning towards, leaning towards, uh, you know, TJ, because, you know, his dad's got the military background and uh, we think he'd be a really good fit. And I was like, no, no, you guys are making a mistake. Barbie <laughs> is the man and Barbie is running OU right now. Like I, I basically said to, to Colonel Polka, exactly what my brother said to me when, when Coach Spates introduced me to Barbie. I was like, no, if you can get Barbie, it's a steal. You're basically getting the engine to Oklahoma's wrestling program. Mm. Uh, and the rest is history. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I've, I've never heard. I mean, Chuck and I, you know, we're pretty close when I was there. He was the head coach you know, all four years I was there. And, like, yeah. his story is so interesting. And we'll love to have him on here. But I remember my, my plebe year, we were at – I was – I traveled with the NCAAs with the guys, and he was telling me his – hit the you know the story of his senior year and all the issues yeah. and he was telling it so like in the third person like all I could think about the entire time was like how are you okay with this now like yeah it's just it was crazy and he was just you know completely at peace with it and um yeah. he helped me a lot like what he went through mm -hmm. what I went through my senior year so yeah we'll get into that some here in a little bit um so when coach Barbie came in mm -hmm. What was different that he brought um, maybe than the, his two predecessors? And, like, obviously he came from Oklahoma State, which is a rich in history and a very successful program. He had a great career. What was kind of, like, his spin? Because every new coach comes in, they got their thing, and they got changes they want to make. What was, what was Coach Barbie's? Um, you know, he brought stability back. It was uh... – it was a welcome change to, um, and I love Coach Giles, so this is not looking down on Coach Giles, but it was a welcome change to um, what we experienced the, uh, the years prior. And I think the years prior, I don't think the team, and it, it wasn't all Coach Giles, I don't think the team fully bought into Coach Giles. So it was just the, it was just a contentious relationship there. And when Barbie came in, um, you know, he was embraced and his philosophy was embraced because nobody at West Point can argue with the success of, of OSU. You can't argue with the success of a, a three-time All-American that is a, a madman when it comes to wrestling back. And, and uh, 
you know, get into that third place. Um, so it was a, it was a, a much needed transition. I know for me, um, in addition to everything that was going on, um, I lost my sophomore year. Uh, I was, I was, uh, 14 and 0. I was ranked fourth in the country actually as a sophomore and uh, tore my rotator cuff in a match and it ended my season. So, you know, if I, if I were at a different school, you know, that's a red shirt year. It's a potential medical um, mm -hmm. year, but, but obviously that's not an option at West Point. Um, so I lost that year next year, um, fooling around with our heavyweight. Uh, he bear hugged me. And I dealt with, uh, and it was stupid. He bear hugged me before practice and rolled my ankle and had a, a high ankle sprain um, my junior year. So I felt like my senior year was my last shot to do it. I was, I was feeling healthy. Um, Barbie had a proven system. You know, you couldn't argue with his pedigree and his background. And I was just like, there's, there's just no excuse for me not to accomplish what I, I set out to accomplish this year. Would you say that um... – you know, those, those like just being healthy going into your first year, you know, where the differences between, you know, the success you had your first year as compared to the first two, your first three years, or were there other factors, you know, conditioning mentally, you know, other factors that made a difference in your first year success? Uh, well, I, I think Barbie, Barbie um, definitely helped. Uh, I think there were a couple gaps in my approach, my strategic approach. To matches um, that he definitely helped but more than anything it was it was um, my health and then just realizing that this was my last shot um, realizing that you know this was my last chance to accomplish what all the other uh, colleges said I couldn't accomplish so but Barbie played a huge part in that and then Barbie brought in uh, Todd Chesbro um, who was also an NCAA runner-up from OSU. And those two together, they had history and they were, um, they brought the OSU culture to Army. So, nice. so uh, you, um, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier with, um, you know, the uncertainty uh, of your senior year. Uh, I understand you had a crazy second semester, your, your first year between the IWAs, T's, finals, going into, you know, graduation. Um, can you dive into that a little bit about, you know, kind of the craziness and how, you know, West Point-isms, you know, affect, you know, affect everything? Yeah, so I'll try to, uh, I'll try to keep it brief. I could talk about this for days. Um, but long story short, um, two weeks before uh, NCAA qualifier, um, my senior year, I'm sitting at probably like 25-0 and 0 at the time. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to accomplish my goal of being a national champ. Um, I was going to uh, physical therapy for just, I, I told you I tore my rotator cuff sophomore year. So it was just something I did, just went to physical therapy all the time. And, uh, and one day I had a, I had a T scheduled for um, third period. I was in physical therapy uh, first period and it ran like 10 minutes into second period. So I decided, um, that I wasn't fully prepared for the T and I was going to skip the remainder of the second period and study for that T um, so I could, I could do well on that test. And the, uh, the second period instructor ended up reaching out to me and saying, where were you doing my class? And I lied to him. I told him I was at uh, physical therapy when really I checked out like 10 minutes in. Um, he called physical therapy to check up. He found out that I checked out like 10 minutes into the class and had deceived them. So that was an honor violation. So, um, I went through a whole like honor board and stuff as a result of that. And, uh, didn't really know that I was going to compete in the national tournament in my senior year, um, up until the Tuesday right before the tournament. So, and, uh, and Barbie coached me through that. He helped me a lot. Like I, I physically broke down at the time. I was the only qualifier, um, Kevin coach Wars doing a great job of, of getting a culture of having a team go to nationals but um at the time I was the only guy and everybody else's season was done and you know, I was breaking down because I didn't know if I was going to be able to compete or not and Butch Barbie uh got the guys to come back in the room rally around me and, and practice with me to get me through that time 
um, went out to NCAAs, uh, kind of numb to the tournament, just went and competed, somehow ended up in the, in the finals, just, just competing. And, uh, I remember before the finals match, like being in the back, just thinking about what I was going at, going through at West Point that at that time, I didn't know if I was going to graduate or not, um, because what had happened. And I really felt like, um, I'd never been in trouble up until that point. And, um, you know, never had an hour or, or any disciplinary action at West Point. And, and I just felt like a, I just felt really embarrassed. I was like, if I win a national title, it's going to be all over the army and they're going to find out I didn't graduate and I'm just going to be an embarrassment to my family and, and everybody that knows me. And, and I went out and performed with that mindset. Um, Josh Koscheck, who I wrestled in the finals, great competitor. Can't take anything away from him. Um, he could have still beat me if I was on top of my game, but it definitely should have been a more competitive match. Um, anybody that watches that match knows that I just wanted off the mat. So, you know, Josh, he he uh, he took me down twice, and the rest of the points were me just sitting on bottom stall, and I was just broke. Um, and he ended up with like three minutes riding time with me just sitting there, just looking at the clock, just wanting to get off the mat and not embarrass myself further. So it was tough to deal with because, I mean, my entire life, um, since I started wrestling at eight, like I always, I always just assumed that I was going to win something at every level. Um, you know, I won my first state tournament as a kid. I won my first Eastern National, which was a big deal back then as a kid. Like I just knew um, I would plan on winning a national title. And uh just didn't happen for for – you know, a circumstance that I could have avoided by, by just being honest and saying, you know, I got out of physical therapy 10 minutes into your class and I could have made it, but I just didn't. At that time, I think um, because I hadn't served an hour, like in my mind, I was thinking, well, if I tell him that I just basically like skipped his class, man, that's going to be like the first hour I ever got at West Point. And, and it's just a stupid decision on my part that led to that. So I ended up, uh, after after uh, finishing runner up, ended up um, going through the the honor process, and um, my company TAC recommended that I got I get kicked out because he said the only time that I showed emotion um, after I got in trouble was when he told me I couldn't wrestle in the national tournament. Everything else I was kind of numb, but when he mentioned that, my tear, you know, just kind of the emotions of of being so vested in the sport just kind of overwhelmed me and. Uh, and he said I had my priorities all mixed up as a result of that. So he recommended separation. Uh, fortunately, his boss and his boss's boss, um, they didn't recommend that. So they recommended that I go into, um, I think it's called the, the Army. I forget what the program's called, but it's basically you go in as an E4 for eight months and then you come out and you graduate the next year. It's a um, mentorship program. Yeah. Yeah, program. yeah, something. I forget the name of it. Um, uh, so <clears throat> the, the, uh, the soup at the time, you know, he'd given me coins for other things that I'd accomplished throughout wrestling. And, and he was, he was transitioning to another assignment, um, that summer. And I remember the day before, like he was, he was done, uh, Jag officer that I was dealing with called me. It was like, do you know the soup? Like he's requesting to, to like rule on if you stay or not, like, this is like the last file he's looking at. He's looking at you and, and a Dom check and a Dom check at the time her dad was the uh, brigade commander and uh, brigade, brigade TAC. And I was like, oh man, maybe he's gonna let me be a December grad. You know, I was, I was hopeful at the time. He ended up recommending that army program where I do the eight months and come back and graduate in 2002. Um, so I go home, I'm expecting to get orders and 9-11 hits in September. And- Talk about I, the uncertainty. You got Three different yeah. head coaches, nine eleven. That's a yeah. It's just my story. I think I think everybody's got a story, and I don't use them as excuses. Like if I was going to be a national, like if I was going to be a national champ, I could have still been a national champ. I think everybody's got obstacles that they had to overcome. Those are just mine. Um, so you know, nine eleven hits, and it was me. And I remember at the time it was it was two other cadets that were in a similar situation where. Our paperwork, we were basically supposed to transition and be E4s in the Army for eight months. Paperwork got lost in the system, and 
and we were basically lost in the system. Like I ended up being in New Jersey at home working for my dad's uh, construction business until like uh, October, November that year. And I'm doing the math. Like I'm not going to be able to graduate with 2002 as a result of, of these guys just forgetting about me. I'm calling Colonel Polka like every other day, like, you know, what's going on? Like, can you help me out? And they ended up uh, calling all three of us back, telling us that our files were, were like kind of lost in all the mayhem of 9-11 and ended up uh, sending us to the prep school, uh, which is kind of ironic because before I got in trouble, I was supposed to be the GA at the prep school. So I ended up going to the prep school being the GA taking over for Matt Ross, who was my co-captain, um, and then ended up walking in 2002. Hey, well, first off, Mo, I got to tell you, I appreciate you sharing that story with us. Certainly not something that everybody talks about very often. Um, yeah. So I appreciate you sharing that. Some of the terms people might have heard that aren't familiar with, T's are um, basically tests at West Point and uh, – at the academy is the yeah at the at the academy the honor code is like cadet will not lie cheat steal or tolerate those that do um and infractions or violations that are found based on that code are dealt with in a very serious manner and i don't say that in a way that i'm you know saying it to moan and negative like i certainly had my own shenanigans that i was involved with i just was never probably caught um Something that Brian mentioned that I'd love to hear your perspective on, Mo, was he talked just very briefly about Coach Barbie. Um, and I don't think you would mind me sharing this, but he had an NCAA violation senior year, was 100% poised to be a national champ that year and didn't have the opportunity com to compete. And Brian spoke earlier about just how at peace he was with that. Can you kind of talk about how maybe he guided you through that situation and – how your perspective on just the entire thing has changed over the course of the last 19 years? Well, I think, um, I think at this point in my life, I'm probably in a similar situation to the, what coach Barbie was where, you know, I'm at, I'm completely at peace at, with, um, with what happened with me. But when it first happened, um, I relied on his piece. So I relied a lot on, on coach Barbie um, being the calm level head in the room, getting me out of the fetal position. <laughs> and because uh, I was just completely distraught, broken down, um, didn't get in trouble, like I said, at all until that point and just felt really defeated. And he was able to navigate me through that situation. And, you know, hindsight, um, looking at it, it was uh, it was probably as a result of him dealing with the the NCAA violation um, that he dealt with, and knowing that life goes on, and um, you make mistakes, you learn from them, you grow, and you move on. But the only way you move on is taking steps forward. Like you can't sit there and shut down and be depressed and be isolated and had he not been there to be the piece for me at that time um yeah I don't know if I would have made it to the tournament and I, I probably would have went only two well I really appreciate you sharing that that uh, I'm sure everybody can take a little bit away from that um no matter where you are in life or if you're a grad or you're trying to you know recruit or a parent taking something away from that sorry my dog's in the background <laughs> Well, I wanted to fast forward then. You talked about how you were in New Jersey working with your dad, Mo, and 9-11 um, hits. Um, I remember when I made my decision to go to West Point, and everybody in, since 9-11 um, entering the academy knew that they were going when there's a conflict going on, whereas um, your class, it was completely different. So yeah. joined at a time of peace. The last conflict would have been um, – what desert shield and desert storm yeah so um what was that like where you entered in a time of peace and then now all of a sudden you're graduated and there's 9 11 and and a war is going on um i mean for uh for us obviously it was a it was a, a very chaotic and, and trying time but i mean that's what we'd spent the last four years preparing to do. 
Um, and we had, and I can just speak for the wrestlers because um, that really was my circle at West Point. So we just had some warriors mentally that embraced any challenge that was thrown in front of them. And to a lot of them, this was just the next challenge. Um, so a lot of them, and, and when I speak about this, I really, you know, Matt Ross, he keeps popping in my head. Like he was a guy that, um, that was just, if you've met him, just salt of the earth type guy, but with the mentality, he's like, he's just tough as nails mentally. And I remember he was in Fort Monmouth at the time. I was home trying to figure out what was going on with me. And he was the GA at the prep school. And I remember calling him like, hey, if you need anything, um, let me know. My family's here for you. Um, but, you know, I could tell that, you know, he completely had it under control. And it, and we knew it was something that we signed up for. And it was just, um, it was just do what we have to do at that point. So it, it, at that point, it's too late to to go back and say, no, I don't want to sign up for this. You know, um, graduation had already happened and, and all the seniors, you know, we were really close. We actually all went like, uh, and this is another story. We actually, um, all went, um, like our senior year, right before the season started, we all went and got army wrestling tattoos, like our logo. So all the seniors from that year, we all have our, our army wrestling tattoos. Oh, we got to get a picture of that up on the page. I don't know if I could put it because I tried to hide it. It's on like my upper thigh. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, what's the design? Is it like uh, a black like knight the, or what is it? No, it's like a sun with like the AW inside of it. Um, I can take a picture and send it. And I'm not showing my thighs on the, on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> my understanding wasn't it kind of trailed off towards like the later years, but it was like kind of a tradition. I thought when you got it on like, whatever your lead leg was, you got it on the thigh there, like right where you like have your singlet would end. And that way, like as soon as your front foot was forward, like that was like your army wrestling tattoo. That's how it was kind of incorporated or explained to me. No, I think, I think we were the first, I could be mistaken, but I really think we were the first class of seniors to um, have everybody go get the tattoo. And we just got them, wherever. So I remember like that was my very first tattoo. And, um, I remember Matt who, uh, was dating at the time, uh, Lindsay, who he's now married to. Um, I remember we were driving like after we got the tattoo and I was like, I got to call my parents and tell them I got a tattoo. <laughs> and I called and we, we kind of took it as a joke. Like the, we had two other seniors, um, in the back, I believe. Um, and we just had the phone on speakerphone as we're breaking the news <laughs> to me and my parents and Matt, he, he called uh, Lindsay and we we're all getting chewed out. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. Like we had them on speakerphones. It was a, it was a good bonding experience. It was one of the, uh, one of my pleasant memories. from West Point. When you came down here a couple of years ago, it was great seeing you guys like reconnect and uh, you know, you and Lindsay seeing each other, you know, not seen each other in so long. Yeah. Uh, brought back some cool memories. I know Matt was telling me about, you know, when 9-11 hit for him, like he was branching field artillery and he literally just drove to Fort Knox and changed his branch to infantry. And like, yeah. like thinking about like, that wasn't that long ago, but you're like, and how HRC worked, he just, he just drove there and was like, I want to be infantry now. I thought that was so yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, he's the, he's the guy, like he is just, he's just a warrior. So he's uh he helped me out a lot at West Point. I remember, so how I met Matt Ross, and like I said, we were we were captains together our senior year, and uh, you know you had like a, what they call it, mass athletics during like uh, during yep. um, so we'd go there and we'd uh, we'd wrestle him around a little bit, but I still didn't really know him because he didn't talk much, I didn't talk much, he didn't smile much, I didn't smile much, <laughs> and uh, and I remember us, us um, during Beast, you know, we were in the auditorium. And they were giving one of those boring lectures that I think they planned just to see how many uh, new cadets fall asleep. And, uh, and he was sitting right in front of me and, uh, and I was fighting hard to stay awake and I nod off. Like I lose it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm losing it. Heads going. And I feel this hard push behind me. And I was like, turn around real quick. Like who pushed me? And I recognized it was Matt. And he was just looking at me. Like, like I said, he didn't say much. He was just like, 
they're coming. <laughs> I was just like, I was like, all right, we're gonna be cool. Me and Matt, we're gonna be cool. <laughs> That's kind of like the beginning of our relationship. That's funny. I th- I feel like you could share beast stories uh, all day. I, I feel like yeah. everybody's class. It's just yeah. It's a different world. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> His son's um, going to be a plebe here in, uh, next month. I saw that. I yeah. saw that. That's awesome. So that was, uh, legacy continues for him. Yeah. It would be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons we even started the podcast was, you know, people go off and graduate. They get super busy in the Army, and they lose, totally lose connection with uh, – some of the people that they were the very closest to for four years. Mm -hmm. Maybe give us just like a real brief synopsis of your time in the military and kind of what you've done after for maybe some people you lost contact with. And then we'll kind of wrap up with some fun questions and let you go. Uh, Yeah. So, I mean, I was, um, you know, after, uh, after graduating in 02, I went and, uh, and I was air defense. So I served, um, I did my PL time in, um, in South Korea. Um, and then after the PL time, spent some time in, uh, in Texas and then, uh, at Fort Bliss and then, um, in South Carolina at Fort Jackson. And then, um, and my last assignment was like a, an ROTC type assignment where I was in Maryland. And, uh, and then from there, we got off the army and, Worked for Exxon Mobil for a while um, until I decided, you know, my wife and I, we were down in Louisiana and we had our first kid. She's from Oklahoma, by the way. So she went to OU with my brother. So um, kind of met All kinds her. of connections. Yeah, met her through my brother <laughs> going to OU. And uh, we were having our second kid and we decided that we wanted to be near family. So it was either Oklahoma or New Jersey. I didn't want to live in Oklahoma. So uh, came back to New Jersey and I was uh, at the last couple of years at Exxon, I, I got into uh, renovating homes and, um, and was doing that and, and business was going well. Um, came up north and, and started doing it up north, but I felt like I was on a hamster wheel a little bit because just the price point to get into renovations is so much higher in Jersey than it is sure. um, in Louisiana. Um, to buy in and, and rehab costs. Um, so while I was here, a high school friend had uh, had um, started um, uh, an online video advertising company, and it was starting to catch some traction. And he knew like my military background. He knew my time at Exxon and stuff, where I was managing um, a team of contractors and stuff. And he wanted somebody to come in and, and basically play GM. He knew my background just because. We were high school. We played football since we were eight, and I was really good friends with his, his cousin, who was a, a tough wrestler in Jersey, also. Um, so he was like, "You know, come in, be a GM. You can learn this business. There's a lot of zeros, a lot of money in the industry." And um, and when I got there, um, I think they were there was a team of probably uh, twelve to fifteen, and um, I started off as GM. Worked my way. Uh, when I left, I was head of construction. Uh, we grew the business to um, about 28 million, and then uh, we sold it for 33 million to a big, um, a big uh, television broadcasting company that was looking to get into the video um, advertising space. And and my good friend, he owned he owned a large portion of that, so I don't see him much much now. <laughs> He's off in the suns. He, uh, you know, actually we we text probably like four or five times a week, so he's really still. A really close friend um and uh so we had that exit which was really good for everybody it was a a four a five person executive team four of us all went to high school together um wow. so it was it was a really big deal for all of our families good windfall good exit um and then from there i looked to to start my own company doing the same thing and uh and it, it took off, uh, grew really big, uh, really fast. And I got greedy and I didn't, uh, I didn't diversify. So I had, um, I had one like juggernaut client that was responsible for um, about 65 to 70% of my revenue. 
And I'd been working with him for a couple of years. He'd been doing just a couple million dollars every year. And uh, there's a big shift in the industry where things got tight for that partner. And the partner decided to hold payments for nine months. And I didn't have the, uh, the cash flow maintenance to, to uh, keep the business going. So I took um, some of the capital that I had uh, remaining and invested in um, a construction company that I'm now a partner in. And uh, I, I closed that business down and I'm looking to infuse a lot of the, the ad tech and, and video technology stuff that we learned, looking to use some of that that's applicable and try to, uh, to grow something special in the construction industry that still has a lot of room for development as far as technology is concerned. That's really interesting. It's good. It's, it's way out of my, my spectrum of knowledge. <laughs> but it's, it's crazy how, how everybody's paths change so much. You know, you, at West Point, you're kind of all doing very similar things. And then you yeah. have the military and you're kind of still doing similar things in, in different branches. And then you get out and it's like, you're all over the place. It's um, really interesting. Yep. And um, I mean, outside of that, I got a beautiful wife, four babies, three boys. And um We've got a we've got a little tribe coming up, so we've got um, eight worthy boys. Oh boy! Um, Future cadets? Uh I mean we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so I definitely Have they went and visited. Yeah, they've been there. Um, yeah, you're not far away. I'm assuming, right? Yeah, I can say for certain that um, I'm not sure about my oldest son. Like, I don't. I'm not going to push it on them, but they're going to know everything about West Point. Um, but my middle son, Christian, like he's the, he's only six, but he's the one he's, all he wears is, is we bought him a pair of like camouflage shoes and he's got like camouflage tights that he tries to wear every single day. And he's out, <laughs> in, the, he's out in the backyard, like trying to build forts, like trying to chop down trees, trying to dig like underground, like storage room. Like, like he's the guy that I'm like, oh man, you are, you're a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah. So, so definitely him, the other ones to be determined. Um, but if they want it, then I'll be there to support them. So if they want to go that route. That's really cool. So we want, we want to wrap up with a few questions. So okay. we're fascinated by Cullum Hall and how you were practicing there and in all of the, I, I, I took my, when I took my recruiting trip, um, you guys were still practicing there and I don't, I don't remember thinking anything of it. Um, I remember my, my plebe year, we were, we had first, that's when we moved back into Arvin and I was like, oh my gosh, this, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, but, and all of the questions that we had, Jordan was <laughs> about what, <laughs> and he put it in the doc, he actually wrote it like, um, wrote it the way I'm going to read it. Cause I was like, when I read it, I was like, what? Because did you guys have a speaker system in the wrestling room? If so, what was bumping in the speaker in the late nineties and early two thousands? I guess uh, music wasn't as big as a thing when I was, you know, we just listened to music at practice, but I guess it was a big thing when he was there. <laughs> uh, so music was a, uh, it was a point of contention for our team. Absolutely. If you had control <laughs> of that aux cord when I was there, you had the power. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we did have um, surround sound in there because, you know, Cullum Hall was like a, I think they were using it as like a dance hall before we got there or something. Um, it was a very unique experience there. Um, so we'd be having wrestling practice and there'd be people practicing on the rock wall that they installed at the other end of Cullum Hall. It was, it was uh, <laughs> very interesting. Did well, it even have heat? It, huh? Did it even have heat? Uh, yeah, it had heat, but it wasn't wrestling room heat. Yeah. Yeah, it was, there was no wrestling room heat. Like, that, oh, like, you walk in and, like, <laughs> your nose just starts, like, steaming. Like, yeah. you, you start sweating from, from tying your shoes and one lap around the mats and you're sweating. No, we didn't have that. So, we had uh, all of our, like, changing facilities and showers were um, across the road at the, uh, at the baseball stadium. So, we were in there. Um a lot of cold showers and and the baseball. Oh, the visiting, <laughs> not not even the home locker room, like the the visiting. <laughs> the visiting locker room. The visiting man. locker room. That's messed up. Yeah, that's life. We had it good, that's for sure. 
Yeah, but I mean, it was a very, like I said, we were the, the class of transition. So we knew it was big things uh, down the road for Army Wrestling with, uh, with the design. Um, yeah, we were a little envious because we we're like, but we're going through this. We don't want to look at pictures of what is going, what Arvin's going to look like down the road. Like, <laughs> yeah, what about right now? Like, I'm, it's uh, very cold outside, and you got me walking across the street to the baseball visiting locker room to take showers. So, but we just sucked it up. We just did what we had to do. So it was kind of, it was normal after you know a couple of weeks. It's crazy. It doesn't feel like that long ago that Arvin was was being built or being redone and rebuilt. Now they're the, the wrestling program's talking about a standalone facility wow. um, and creating a you know a state of the art. They've been talking about it for uh, you know a little while now, but that's the that's the plan ahead for the next couple of years is to get that. That's to, awesome. Um, so yeah, cool times ahead for the program. But who who had the power and what were you guys listening to? I still gotta know. Oh uh, man, so it depends. Like if the uh if the hip hop crew got the uh yeah got to the uh the stereo first we were listening to um it was outcast was big at the time um it was always like biggie or tupac yep. um and then you know they were uh me and matt we used to have uh arguments all the time he was like, I don't, like, because he mentioned a name so much, I don't really know country, but Conway Twitty was a name that he, like, <laughs> like threw out, like, all the times. So that was, like, Matt's guy. And then I just remember um, Green Day, like, they, like, whatever album came out around that time, like, we had a group of guys that just played that in the ground. And then, um, and then I had a roommate, Ryan Kelly, that, he loved like heavy metal. So I was like a, I was like a, um, like an R and B, like a, like a Tupac type guy. And he was like heavy metal and we we're roommates. And I just remember like every day, like at wrestling, like if he had to pick the music and the whole like heavy metal crew. And, um, I would just always go up to him and be like, Ryan, why are these guys screaming at me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what did I do to deserve this? These guys, they're screaming at me again. I have no idea what I did. So, but it was, uh, that's awesome yeah we took turns so. that's awesome yeah so i kind of wrapping it up so you mentioned you had three sons um the sport of wrestling's made a lot of changes since you last competed maybe are you still involved i saw online you're with the rhino wrestling club are you still with them oh uh, yeah yeah until like covid took off so i was um sure i try to leave my son uh mo alone so there's some really good coaches there um that that uh really like sewed a lot into my son um coach greg coach mark you guys probably know mark gray uh, mm -hmm. my son you know he loves those guys coach them here um they really really like like are just really good with my son and i try like i, I can get like my son he's even at eight like he He's just very athletic. Like he's walking on his hands and he, he does things that's, that gets me excited. And I'm like, all right, we're ready to go D one level. Let's turn it up. <laughs> like, I need, to, like I need to fall back with him. So I, I push him um, over there and let him go with those guys. Yeah. Occasionally like I'll dig into his butt, but I still want him to be a kid. Like it has to be his sport. It's, it's his thing, but I demand that he works hard. Um, and what I've do, done just cause the room is, is, is a decent size is my six year old Christian. Um, I just got him started last year is I pull all those little, um, like tots, like those little, like six year olds and I work with them. So I'm teaching awesome. like, penetration steps and just stance. And, and I had a, I had a gang like before, um, like this COVID stuff took off, we had a gang of like. 10 or 12 like little like six and seven year olds that were like ready to do damage at the bantam level <laughs> were they just were they hitting your your outside step uh high crotch both sides just like you do no nah, we didn't get there yet so <laughs> we're basically i mean we're we're uh it's even dumb they're they all like i all had them i had them all getting really good at like double hook snaps to like steering wheel, faking one way, 
getting behind, just like short offense and then getting into like some front headlock stuff. Like their stuff is probably better than um, a lot of like nine and 10 year olds. Cause that's like that's some good happen. stuff. Like getting on people's heads, snap, and and just being real comfortable in that short offense position. So some uh, some killer. I'm excited for things to open back up and to get going with those guys. So. Absolutely. I was just gonna ask, um, kind of how your outlook on, or maybe your approach to sports different with your son than maybe it was for your own career. Well, I have a different level of knowledge. So my dad, he wrestled in high school, but. Um, he was a knucklehead, so I, wrestling wasn't a priority. And, you know, as a result of him being a knucklehead, he made sure, like, me and my brother were, like, very, very strict in what we did, and we ended up having success. We're actually the last brothers to win state titles the same year in uh, in 96. Um, wow. And, you know, my brother, he was he was a beast in high school. He was 128 and two, three-time state champ. Um, and, and that was all a result of – of my dad's philosophy and how he approached pushing us to the next level because he didn't live up to his full potential. And my approach, because I've accomplished a little more, I've seen a little more in the sport is um, I know it's a marathon and I have to, um, I have to do everything in my power to make sure that my son falls in love with the sport. So I mm-hmm. want him to practice good habits and stuff. But for me, the most important thing right now is for him to fall in love with the sport and then I can turn it up on him. So, <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I can't I can't turn it up until he has that love um, for the sport. Or, you know, you break the little kids and that's why you have a lot of, of uh, eight and nine-year-old state champs that don't wrestle in middle school. Yeah, it's too hard of a sport to gas it up if they don't yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great lesson for a lot of parents out there that are hopefully going to tune in. <laughs> yeah, like you can't live through your kids. And it's tough because it's balanced. <clears throat> like it's not all living through your kids. Like some of it is like you just want the best for your kid. Like I talked to my son, like you've got as far you've got an advantage, like background. Your, your mom was a D1 runner at Oklahoma. Your dad was a pretty good wrestler. Like you're off, <laughs> you're off to a you're off to a very good start. Like, little like, man is good to go. <laughs> yeah. So so all you got to do is all you got to do is practice at the D one level now as an eight year old. <laughs> but yeah, I have to I have to check that and like I said, just really make sure that it's all about him and uh, and that he grows to really love the sport because if you don't love it, you know it's it's not going to stick. And even if it does stick, if you're forced to do it you're not going to perform like you're not going to excel. Well, I hope we see a resurgence of some uh, worthy men in Army single in the next 10 to 15 years. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. The Worthies and the Simpsons are going to take over, you know, all the weight classes in, in <laughs> yeah. 10, 10, 10 or 15 years. But yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a tribe of them, of uh, both. I think – how many how many kids does uh, – well, the Simpsons, I think they got a, a ton going on right now. 73? They've got – at one point, I know that they had 17 under the age of seven between the three bro- three brothers. Oh my goodness, that's crazy. I mean, I'm a little older now, but I, I told I was I was always telling them like you need to write a book like 17 under seven. Yeah, parenting book right there. Yeah, um, but yeah. they can't all they can't all go to army. I mean, to be a, a, they're gonna have to have they're gonna have to have wrestle offs to see who gets accepted to army. Who gets the appointment? Yeah, who gets the appointment? <laughs> like you don't make it. You don't you don't make first string. You got to go to to uh, and we won't send them to the Navy. Nah. Coast Guard. Yeah. Like Citadel. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to send. We don't want them send send uh send the rest of them anywhere because there'll be there'll be too much competition. We got to split them up. The ones that don't get the uh, the Army appointment. <laughs> awesome. Well, we really appreciate you coming on this coming on the show, Mo. And, and yeah, thanks a lot. I think is I I learned so much um you know i really appreciate you giving back and i think all, all the fans out there um really appreciate all your insight and your stories yeah thanks for having me you guys are uh you guys what you're doing is awesome just growing the uh the fan base around army wrestling so excited to see you guys grow awesome yeah i think uh coach ward right now is having uh, like a zoom meeting with other you know with other alumni to try and you know help help connect and grow um grow that bond as well so uh, I'm getting. I was getting some text messages earlier. If you're looking, see me looking down, like why are you looking at his phone? Everyone's like, "Where are you in the Zoom call?" I'm like, 
I have a different Zoom call. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time, Mo. Best of luck to you, and uh, I'm sure we'll talk again sometime else in the future. All right, man. You guys take care. I'll see you. Too. All right. Later. Thanks for tuning in to the B-Hall Radio Show. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe and leave us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. If there's something you'd like to hear on a future show, reach out to us on any of our social media, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Or you can reach us at email, bhaw.radio at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts. And as always, go Army, be Navy.